welcome to our next section here um, in our chapter on evolutionary algorithms. So here I'll introduce genetic algorithms and how they operate on bit strings. So we'll explain recommendation and mutation operators and then look at a few fairly simple examples. So um, in theory, of course, we could encode all problems um, in binary because we can basically represent anything on a computer, I guess, um, through bits. But whether that makes sense and um, yeah, whether that's um, the best representation for a certain problem, yeah, that depends a lot on the domain, that depends on the semantics of the problem, and that um, depends uh, first and foremost on um, the aspect whether we can define meaningful crossover and mutation operators for, um, for these representations. So for numerical real value vectors for trees or for computer programs, like a vanilla straightforward binary encoding, well, I'm not even sure whether that's straightforward, but it's kind of a, um, this, this general always applicable binary encoding is not necessarily the best choice. So we usually encode problems that have uh, binary decision variables as a binary representation. So an example might, for example, be linear programming. So we've discussed this before, where um, the LP, so the linear program, featured a d-dimensional input vector of real values. Um, sometimes you look at, uh, um, or there are, uh, there, there are uh, variations of this linear, uh, um, of these linear programs where you only look at uh, integer features, so even only binary features, and it turns out that such ILPs, integer linear programs, or BLPs, binary linear programs, are actually pretty expressive. So you can um, solve quite a few interesting optimization uh, tasks with them. And sometimes it's not obvious that you can um, encode um, a certain problem as an ILP. Um, and there are also then um, specific um, uh, specific algorithms kind of tailor-made for these ILP uh, problems, but you could also, um, especially for for, um, yeah, for binary linear programming, run an evolutionary algorithm on that, and then you would have really have binary decision variables, so zeros and ones, which you could encode as such. You can also run this for scheduling problems, so um, for example, to create schedules for high-performance computing clusters, so, so which computational task assigned to which node, or to which, uh, yeah, to which CPU or to which core. So usually there, then you have these binary choices. Um, I guess you can also encode that um, as an integer linear program, which again shows how, um, yeah, um, how powerful uh, these, these ILP coding schemes are. Um, or um, maybe more uh, in the scope of our lecture here, you could um, encode a feature selection problem in machine learning as a binary decision problem. So for each feature, you can have a decision variable whether to have the feature in the model or not, and then again, run a genetic algorithm on that. And that we'll look here, look at as an example here at the end of this uh, section. So before we do this, let's uh, go through the motions and discuss the recomb uh, recombination, so the crossover and the mutation operators. Um, again, as before, uh, I will encode my two parents as x and x tilde. They are now d-dimensional bit strings. And the first crossover operator I can define is um, pretty much inspired again by biology. So we would have our two parents here. So this would be uh, our x and this would be our x tilde. Uh, this is supposed to be our resulting offspring. And for the one point crossover operator, we choose randomly a cutoff point. Yeah? So some point here between the genes. And now we generate our offspring by copying over the first part from the first parent and then the second part from the second uh, parent. Okay, So this goes here and this guy goes there. Now we can also now create a second offspring if you wanted to. So we can take this part here now uh, from uh, the... So we can take the first part now from the second parent and the last part from the first parent, and that would give, would give rise to a second, a kind of, in a certain sense, I don't know, inverted offspring. There's also uniform crossover. Um, it's even easier so that simply selects each bit 
with a certain probability either from the first parent or from the second parent. So this probability again we call P. And again, usually there's no bias to select uh, um, from a certain parent. So we would set P to 0.5 um, in most cases, I guess. Okay, so here again, you can see an example where this bit was sampled from the first parent. This was also sampled from the first parent. And these guys were all uh, ran, yeah, by random chance sampled from the second parent. Now, which of these operators makes the most sense depends a bit on um, whether bits and their associated meaning, um, which are next to each other in the encoding, um, yeah, kind of are somehow linked. Okay, so whether um, these kind of building blocks here in the bit strings, whether they have some form of, I don't know, semantic meaning, um, or whether you can basically randomly reorder these bits and you have, in a certain sense, encoded the same object. So I think this is pretty difficult to understand in the abstract, so let's make it a bit more concrete. So maybe let's talk about this uh, feature selection problem, which I want to introduce uh, at the end of the section here anyway. So assume you're given a data matrix, okay? Um, so you have your N observations here and you have your P features and you now have a decision variable for each bit, uh, sorry, for each feature. So for each feature you have a bit and that bit encodes whether you want to include this feature in your ML model or not, okay? So in this case here, you would have five, five features. This guy, the first feature would be included. The last feature, the fifth feature would also be included and these guys would not be in the model. So two, three and four. Now, which of these two crossover operators would we choose? So you can now ask yourself the question, if I reorder my bits here and hence I reorder my features, does anything relevant uh, in the problem in the candidate in the encoded candidate solution change? And the answer is no, right? So it doesn't really matter whether the first feature column is, is really placed in the first position or whether we place it here. So we can just commute the columns and then fit our ML model again. And yeah, the only thing that kind of changes um, is, is, is potentially, I don't know, the, the label of the features or, so, or something like this, but it would, it, the data matrix contains exactly the same information and it gives rise to exactly the same model, uh, modulo, I don't know, um, labels of the features, maybe. Yeah? Um, so, if that's the case, uh, if the order is not important, then we would use this uniform crossover here and not really this uh, one point crossover. Maybe also as a slight um, um, extra comment here, there's also a generalization of this guy here for the one point crossover. So of course you can also do a multi point crossover. So if you have your two bit strings here, you can also do two cutoff um, points or three or four. So there's like a general end point crossover. So if you now generate your new offspring, you um, can, for example, take this part here, sorry, uh, this part here from the first guy, this part from the second guy, um, and then again, this part here from that guy. So that would be a two point crossover, you can do a three point, four point and so on. How does mutation look for bit strings? Um, Again, fairly simple. So we have our bit string here. Now for each um, index, for each bit, we basically flip a coin with a low probability, I don't know, 1%, 5% or something like this. And uh, if the bit flip succeeds, uh, sorry, if the coin flip succeeds, we would flip the bit. Yeah? So with a low probability, we would flip, flip a bit and with a uh, yeah, with one minus P, um, probability the bit would stay the same and we do that independently for each bit. So this gives rise to a slight local modification of our bit string. Um, usually um, you flip bits in a symmetric sense. So you do not care whether you flip from one to zero or from zero to one. So this would here from, from one to zero and this would be from zero to one. Um, there are cases again, feature selection might be interesting um, where you uh, could also do asymmetric flips. So where you are more inclined to flip from one to zero than from a zero to one, um, because you want to generate a sparse solution. So you rather like 
um, bit strings where you have a low amount of ones in there, this can also be done. Um, and this is where you would then kind of yeah, specifically design these operators for your target domain. Now, let's take a look at two examples. Um, so the first one is, in a certain sense, ridiculously simple. So this is the so-called one max problem. You can kind of see this also as a sanity check for uh, genetic algorithm to succeed. Um, I've also included this here because uh, um, there's a fairly um, large amount of theoretical analysis available um, on such simple problems like the one max. So how is that defined? So we have a d-dimensional bit string and the goal is simply to find the vector with all bits being active, so all bits being one. So like I said, the solution is obvious. Uh, so just set every bit to one. So like I said, you can see this simply as a sanity check whether our genetic algorithm can find that. Now, here we run a genetic algorithm with um, mu equals uh, 15. So 15 um, elements in our population, we generate five offspring. We run a mu plus lambda strategy with bit flip mutation. Um, so apparently here we do, don't even do any recomb uh, recombination. So in a certain sense, this is just a kind of a um, um, local stochastic search. And here in the visualization, you can see how our um, population develops because now we have 15 elements in each population. We only represent the best individual per iteration. So here on the x-axis, you can see the bits. And you, with the green dot, you can see whether a bit is active. On the y-axis, you can see how the iterations develop, and you can see uh, here, even in this in this last line, how uh, the fitness of that best individual develops. So in the beginning, the best best individual has eight bits flipped on, nine, ten, and so on. And at the end, we have found a solution where all um, bits are active. So so far, so good. Um, let's move on to maybe a more complicated setting. So this would be. Um, a simple feature selection problem. Again, in practice, I would probably not run an evolutionary algorithm on this because we would now study this here in, um, yeah, in the setting of feature selection for a linear model. I'll probably run something else that's more efficient, but um, yeah, for didactic purposes, let's see how an evolutionary algorithm performs. So um, we use a simple simulated setting here. So I create a design matrix with a with a thousand rows and with p equals 50 independent uh, normally distributed features i guess i'm not going to read out all of the settings because they are not um, that interesting and mainly given here for for reproducibility and then i will assume the following linear regression setup uh, so being true as the underlying function so um, my design matrix times a vector theta plus some gaussian noise is my numerical outcome. And for my true underlying vector theta, um, yeah, there's an intercept term and then some of these thetas here, so the associated coefficients for our features are only one for some features and zero for all of the rest. So I have, let me maybe count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight relevant features in my model, all with the same coefficient size and then everything else is irrelevant. And yeah, well, I could have also read the last line on the slide, which <laughs> says that it's eight uh, influential features. Um, now we run um, feature selection on this. Uh, sorry, we run an evolutionary algorithm on this. So first of all, we have to pick an encoding scheme. I already explained that. So we have a bit now for each feature, whether the feature is in the model or not. We randomly initialize our population and we evaluate it. Um, now we will apply um, crossover and mutation. So um, for crossover, we use this uniform crossover with p equals 0.5 for the reasons I explained before. And we use a pretty strong mutation here. So we bit flip uh, each uh, decision variable with 30%. And as a fitness function, we use the BIC of our model. Okay, So we compute uh, the Bayesian information criterion for our linear model for each of these um, yeah, associated uh, bit strings, which define which of, of which of our features are included in the model. And then we use a mu plus lambda selection strategy as the survival selection with uh, our population size of mu equals 150 uh, offsprings. So um, 
you can see how this develops after 10 iterations. Uh, you can see um, for the best contained individual, which features are active. You can see what happens after 20 iterations and here what happens after 24 iterations. And if you compare this guy here with the features which are in our model, you can see that it has found exactly the correct solution. And here you can also see how the fitness develops as box, box plots. So here you have the complete fitness values of all contained individuals in the population. And the red uh, line here marks the value of the best individual. So that's the thing that we are mainly interested in. You can see also here over time how the mean or median, um, median fitness um, develops fairly well. Um, and you can also see how the um, so, uh, fitness of the best individual um, improves over time. So we already had a pretty good individual in the um, in the initial population, I guess, but this still improves. I guess we could see this a bit better if we would plot this um, this guy here on um, log scale. Um, and again, um, a less nice visualization in X-Space. So again, we now have the problem that we have our multiple candidates in X-Space, which are d-dimensional to visualize. So again, here we visualize the uh, best individual of um, the current population and here the green bits yeah, or the green dots um, show the bits which are active for this best individual. You can see that in the beginning that's fairly random and um, here you can see uh, the bits string um, of the best individual after 24 iterations which is um, the optimal solution. So this is this, this guy here. You can also see that the, the algorithm learns fairly early on in the beginning that it should probably include the first feature and the 25th uh, and here at some point it also learns fairly early on that it probably should include the 44th feature and you can see that these guys here are also uh, sorry that was actually not 44 but uh, 43 um, so these guys here yeah um, are learned fairly early on um, by the GA to include them in the best solution.